kids five and under are also dismissed to nursery. Although if you would prefer to have your kids in here with us and not take them to nursery, that's perfectly fine. Will you open with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6? Will you pray with me? Father, your love is unfathomable. It, it is immeasurable. God, you loved us so that you would send your son to redeem us from our sin. We pray that this morning as we gather to worship, as we gather to read your word, that it would be in the spirit of what you've already done, that you saved us from death, that you joined us to yourself, and that one day you'll come back to get us. Lord, you have also given us a law. You have also laid down a, a standard of righteousness that you would have from your people. We know that we can't merit that righteousness in our own strength, in our own skill. And yet, God, as a response to your salvation, as a response to your kindness, we desire to live in holiness and in righteousness. So we pray that you would help us today as we read your law, that we would behold wondrous things in your law, the most, import the most important of which is your son who kept the law. We pray that as we uh, read the law that you've laid down, that we wouldn't just see a bunch of rules that we can't keep, but we would see the one who did keep them and who is risen from the dead. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy 6, our text will be verses 10 through 19 today. Let me just remind you of context. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, we read what Jesus called the great and first commandment. And I'll, we'll just read it briefly. Verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the entire law. This is, according to Jesus, the law and the prophets, the entire Old Testament boiled down into one command. It is to love the Lord. Love was at the core of the Sinai covenant. Love is at the core of God's covenants and relationship with people. God loves us. And God commands us to love him in return. Last week, and, and for the foreseeable future, we are talking about how the rest of the law is expanding upon this commandment to love God. And so what did we see last week in verses 6 through 9? We saw that if we love God, that it will be apparent in how we love his word. If we love God, then we will love the word that he has inspired to be written. Can you imagine if... If I say that I love my wife and my wife has been gone on a trip for six months or a year and she writes me a love letter and I say, I love my wife, but man, I hated that letter and I threw it in the garbage. There'd be a serious problem there, wouldn't there? If we love God, we will love his word. It will bleed out into every sphere of our life. So we saw that it, it should be in our hearts. It should be in our homes. It should be in our communities. It should be with us wherever we go. Now, as we continue expanding upon the first commandment, Moses is going to tell Israel how they are to love God once they get into the land. When you get into the land, you are going to face different temptations, and, and here's how you can remember God and love God. And that, that's our key word this morning. If you want a, a singular point, if you want our time together boiled down into one point, it's this. When Israel gets into the land, they are commanded to love God by remembering God. Love God by remembering God and the various temptations that you'll face. And we'll read of three. And so we're going to read our text, Deuteronomy 6, verses 10 through 19. But there's a fun little fact for you this morning. Jesus quoted our text twice in the same episode of the Gospels when he was tempted by Satan. He quoted this text, Deuteronomy 6, twice. So we're going to read it, see if you can pick out the quotes 
from Jesus. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. We are going to have three groups of people and three temptations this morning. So you could say that there's nine points, but really it's three big points with three subpoints apiece. Three groups and three temptations. The first group that we're going to look at is Israel. We're going to look at how they would have heard this in their original context or what this meant for them in their original context. Then we'll look at how Christ faced those temptations and then we'll talk about how we face those temptations. So those are the three groups, Israel, Christ, and us. And then we're going to look at three temptations. Prosperity, a plurality, and adversity. Prosperity, a plurality, and adversary. Little ad- adversary. Adverse- adversity. <laughs> Let's first look at Israel's temptation in prosperity. Prosperity, wealth, riches will provide a snare for Israel. Read with me verses 10 through 12 again. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you didn't build, and houses full of all good things that you didn't fill, and cisterns that you didn't dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you didn't plant, when you guys are comfy, warm, luxurious, then take care. Take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Moses is saying, love the Lord your God. That's our context, right? This is the the great commandment. Once you go into the land, what are going to be the things that tempt you to leave your love for Yahweh? What are going to be the, the scenarios, the temptations that distract you from God, that cause you to forget him? Number one is material blessing, prosperity, wealth, Now, he says in verse 12, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land. What does it mean that they would forget? Remember, in in the Old Testament, the word forget, the word remember, they don't exactly mean the same things that we mean when we say forget and remember. What I mean by that is when Israel gets into the land, they're not going to forget that God exists. It's not like you're going to say, do you worship Yahweh? And they're going to say, who? Who are we talking about here? They're going to remember that he exists. It's not that they're going to forget the exodus. How did you get here? I don't know. They're not going to forget that. They're going to remember the story. God rescued us from slavery in Egypt. He brought us into this land. He used us to conquer the wicked Canaanites. When it says forget, it means that they're going to stop caring. It means that they're not going to live in light of the past. That's, that's my favorite way to describe forgetting and remembering in the Old Testament. It means you'll remember the past, you won't care about the past. You'll remember the past, you won't live in light of the past. Now just to illustrate that, this is from Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verses 13 and 14. It says that Israel forgot his works when they had a wanton craving in the wilderness, and they put God to the test in the desert. Testing is another key word in our text today. How did Israel forget God? That story actually is right after the Exodus. They're in the wilderness. They all saw the Exodus with their own eyes. They didn't forget it, but it says they had a wanton craving. In other words, the manna that God was providing wasn't enough. They didn't care about the manna. 
They didn't care about the water. They said, we want meat. That's testing too. We'll come back to testing. The point is, they forgot by saying, we don't really care what you've done in the past. It's not enough. We want something now. And so here's what, when Moses says, take care lest you forget, he's going to say, it is going to be very easy once you get into the promised land and have all this stuff that you didn't actually work for. All this stuff that God has just given you, lavished on you out of his kindness, you're going to forget. And you're going to stop caring and stop being thankful that God gave it to you out of his grace. Now, there's another way that Israel is going to forget, and we'll cover it in chapter 8. And it's not just that they'll stop caring, it's that they'll take credit for it themselves. Deuteronomy 8, 17. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was the, the king of Babylon, and he's walking out on his walls and looking at the city, and he's saying, is this not the city and the empire that I have built? We forget God when we stop caring about his provision in the past. We forget God when we take credit for his provision. Now, did we work for things? Sure, we, we did. But Deuteronomy 8 continues to say, it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Israel, in a sense, worked for those blessings because they went in and had to slaughter the Canaanites. Who gave them the power to slaughter the Canaanites? Who was it that sent confusion and hornets among the Canaanites? It was God. So here's what God is saying. Here's what Moses is saying. When you go into the land and you are prosperous and wealthy and comfortable, you will be tempted to forget. Do you know what that tells me, beloved? Prosperity is a dangerous place. Wealth and blessings can be dangerous. Now, does that mean wealth and prosperity are inherently evil? No, or else God would not grant them. But the point is, because we are wicked, and because it is so easy for us to get our eyes focused on other things, prosperity and wealth and blessings can be dangerous for us. When's the last time the world told you that? When's the last time Joel Osteen told you that? <laughs> People tell you you should get wealth, you should get money, you should get everything that you can get. And yet scripture tells us over and over and over, wealth is, it can be a good thing. It can also be a detriment to your body and your soul. Beloved, let us be warned. Prosperity can destroy us. Riches can be dangerous. I once read Augustine say something like this. I modified this quote. Augustine said something like this. Many of us fear trials and poverty. But how many of us fear prosperity and wealth? And yet, the fact is that prosperity is more perilous to our soul than adversity is to our body. In a sense, riches are more dangerous than poverty, and yet none of us are afraid of being rich. Augustine's conclusion is we need to take careful, stricter watch against prosperity. That is the first temptation that Israel is going to face is wealth and prosperity. And Moses says, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, you won't forget that he's the one who gave you that. He's the one who lavished his grace on you. You won't cease to be thankful. You will be blown away and floored that God has blessed you so, second temptation that they'll face is a plurality, a plurality of gods. And we read this in verses 13 through 15. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. The second temptation is this. Israel, when you go into the land, nobody is going to acknowledge your God. You will be the only ones. Everybody else is going to be worshiping other gods. Nobody is going to care about yours for the most part. And back in those days, even if you could convince people to worship your God, usually it meant they would take your God and add it to their own collection of gods that they already worshiped. Monotheists didn't really exist. You know what I mean when I say that? A monotheist is a person who worships one God. 
Everybody was polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. And Israel's going into the land where they alone worshipped Yahweh, and they alone worshipped him alone. And Moses is saying, it is going to be a temptation for you when none of your neighbors will acknowledge your God, especially alone. It is going to be a temptation for you when they worship other gods and they, in fact, invite you. Yeah, keep worshiping Yahweh. Keep worshiping the God who rescued you from Egypt. Just worship ours too. We have gods of fertility. We have gods of war. We need the gods to help us with those kinds of things. Just worship with us. In fact, back in those days, um, with, with Jews and with Christians, if something bad happened, let's say during the time of the Greeks or the Romans, they're going, the gods are mad at us. Why are they mad at us? Probably because that group of people over there is not worshiping our gods with us. So let's go after them. If you refuse to worship their gods, it was a source of persecution. They'd come after you and say, no, you have to worship with us. You have to bow the knee to Caesar. Now, the tough thing for us is that we don't understand the temptation that Israel faced in terms of worshiping other gods. Now, we have idols of our own day, but it's not the same. It doesn't look the same. If somebody were to come to you and say, hey, um, I have a, a shrine to Baal in my house, and I would love if you would come have dinner with me and let's pray to Baal together. If your neighbor did that to you, you'd be like, what? No way. It doesn't make sense. If they told you, look, we've got this temple filled with temple prostitutes. I want you to come and worship my gods with me. You'd go, what? There is just, there's no, there's no incentive there for you, right? It doesn't make sense to us. But the fact is, in those days, that is what the whole world was doing. And so it was indeed a temptation to Israel. And some scholars have written down different reasons why that are helpful for us. Israel would have been tempted. Let me just share a couple with you. Number one. This is from Kevin DeYoung's book on the Ten Commandments. When I preached on the Ten Commandments, I recommended this book. Kevin DeYoung on the Ten Commandments, he says, number one, it was easy to worship other gods. And here's why. Because a good Canaanite didn't need an elaborate moral code or a rigorous pursuit of holiness. He just had to show up and present an offering. The gods didn't care how you lived. You could go worship the gods. You could go your own way and live however you wanted. Israel had to wear certain clothes and eat certain foods and live holy. It was easier to be a pagan. That was part of the temptation. Number two, it was convenient. There were many places one could go and take care of his religious obligations. Why not build a few high places? Why not make worship a little more convenient? Where did Israel have to worship? In Jerusalem. Three times a year, remember? Three times a year. You take your tithe to the city of Jerusalem. And if it's too far, you sell your tithe where you live, you take the money, you take that to Jerusalem three times a year. That's a lot of work, isn't it? It was more convenient to say, look, we've got a temple just right down the road. Don't worry about going to Jerusalem. Worship Yahweh here in the high places. Idol worship was convenient. Third reason, it was normal. Everyone else did it. Everyone else did religion the same way. Israel alone was, was unique. And so for Israel, you've got these people that have more. The easier, doesn't require holiness codes. More convenient, it's closer. More common, everybody's doing it. It was a temptation for Israel, if you get my point, to worship other gods. Now, I think the tough thing for us is that we have idols in our own day. And if I were to ask you, what are the idols of our culture? We could probably pick out a few. But we're, in a sense, like fish in water. We don't know that we're wet. And I think that if the Lord tarries, history is going to look back and say, yep, and in 21st century America, evangelicals were tempted by these idols that people aren't going to understand anymore, maybe. Nonetheless, Israel is going to be tempted by a plurality of gods. And Moses is saying this, if you love God, then when you get into the land and nobody else cares about your God and everybody else is worshiping easier, more conveniently, everybody's doing it, if you love God, you'll remain devoted to him. You'll stay. You won't go after other gods. Third temptation is adversity. We read this in verses 16 and following. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. 
You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he's commanded you, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. Now, we've already talked a lot about the commandments and the statutes and the rules and, and, and the blessings that would come to Israel by those, so I'm not really going to pay much attention to verses 17 through through 19, but we are going to zoom in on verse 16. Look at verse 16 again. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. I want to answer two questions. Number one, where are you getting the idea of adversity from? I said that the third temptation is adversity or, or trials or lack or poverty or want. Where am I getting that idea from? Number, I'm, I'm getting it from what commentators are pointing out that, that Massa in Israel's history, was a time of lack and poverty and want. It was a trial. Okay, and if, if you want to read about the story of Masa later on, it's in Exodus 17. Very popular story, very common story. And it's, again, right after Israel is brought out of Egypt. It's right after the Exodus. And they come into a place where there's no water. They're out in the, in the wilderness. It's hot, it's dry, and there's no water to drink. And how does Israel respond? Do they say, Lord God, you have proven in the Exodus that you have all power. You destroyed the Egyptians. You protected us without a scratch. You parted the Red Sea. You drowned our enemies. You've been providing for us here in the wilderness. We know that you have the power, and we know that you love us enough to provide water. Lord, will you please provide us with some water? No. No. No, instead Israel gets out and they go, so did God just want us to die of thirst out here in the wilderness? You know, we had water back in Egypt, right? Talk about gratitude, talk about love, right? That's Masa. And in fact, Masa means testing. And it's the place, it's not mean testing, meaning God tested Israel. It's testing as in Israel tested God. And that's why Moses is saying here, you shall not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Masa. So where am I getting the idea of adversity from? From the fact that Masa was a time when they had a need and they tested God. And that's our second question that I want to answer under this point. What does it mean to test God? Well, as I just told you, testing means that they forgot the past. Not that they forgot the historical factual data. They didn't care. And for them, the exodus wasn't enough. And for them, God's promises weren't enough. God said, I made promises to your fathers. I love you guys. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to rescue you from your enemies. I'm going to take you into a promised land flowing with milk and honey. Wouldn't that be enough? You think so? Wouldn't the exodus be enough? You would think so. No, they forgot. They didn't care. They tested God by Exodus 17, verse 7, says that they tested God by asking the question, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Testing means they ignored the past, they ignored his promises, and they made demands in the present. We don't care about the promises made. We don't care about the exodus. Friends, they ask the question, is God among us? There's a pillar of cloud and fire right next to them. They have all of the proof that they need to know that God is with them, and yet they say, we don't care. None of that's enough. God, you have to prove yourself again. That's testing God. Moses is saying this. When you go into the land, you are going to face the test of prosperity. You're going to have seasons where you have everything you need and more. And in those seasons, you're going to be tempted to forget God. You are also going to face a plurality of gods. Nobody's going to worship your God. They're all going to invite you to be a part of their idolatry. You need to stay with God. And here's this third test, this third temptation. You're going to have times when you don't have what you need. Are you going to remember the past? Are you going to trust in God's promises? Don't test God. Don't make demands of God. Don't force his hand. Don't make him prove himself yet again. That is testing. That is sin. And if you love God, you won't do it. 
If you love God, you'll live in the past. If you love God, you'll live in the promises. If you love God, you will live in his faithfulness. You see, those are the three temptations that Israel was going to face in the promised land. Those are the three arenas where Israel will be tempted, not the only three, where Israel will be tempted to forget God, to depart from loving God, to go worship other gods. Moses is saying, if you love God, you'll stay with him through all of it. What about Christ? What does this have to do with Jesus? I was reading a, a, some John Owen. He was an old Puritan. He said something that really struck me, and I thought I'd share it with you. He says, the main purpose of all the teaching that you've received from ministers, what's the point of all this preaching? Has been to enable you to contemplate Christ. What do you, what, you're asking me, what should I walk away with Week to week. Well, it depends because each text is different. But the same thing each week is pastors want you to go home and think about what that text told you about Jesus. What does this have to do with Jesus? How does this drive me to love him more? Now, what about our own text? What does our own text have to do with Jesus? Because remember, Jesus told the, the Pharisees in John 5. John 5, 39. He says, if you were reading Moses rightly, you would believe in me. If you believed Moses, you would believe in me because Moses talked about me. And of course, one of the ways, the plainest way that Moses did that was the predictions. There's going to be a king from Judah. There's going to be a prophet like me. There's going to be things that happen. You'll know that that's the guy. But another way that Moses predicts Christ or Moses really draws us a silhouette of Christ is through the law. So when we see the guy that keeps the law, we go, there's something about him. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, go into the city. They said, where, where should we have the Passover? Jesus says, go into the city. When you see a guy carrying a jar of water, that's the guy I want you to talk to. Moses is saying, when you see the guy who keeps the law, you look at this law, you see that you can't keep it. When you see the guy who actually keeps the law, that's the guy you need to put your hope in. Don't put your trust in sinful men. Put your trust in Jesus, who's never failed once. So what does our text have to do uh, with Jesus? Well, we come back to the fact that Jesus quoted this text twice. Did you catch those quotations, by the way? Number one, when we go to the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, and you don't have to turn there, I'll just tell you about it. Jesus tested, or excuse me, Satan tempted Jesus in this way. He said, jump off the temple. Jump off the temple. Do you remember? Satan quoted the Bible in support. Interesting that the devil uses scripture to support his point. Jesus, the Old Testament says that God will take care of his Messiah to the point that he won't even stub his toe on a rock. Jump off the temple. What's he asking him to do? Force God to prove his, force God's hand. His word says it. You've been okay thus far. Jump off the temple and see if he will still protect you. If you really trust in God, jump. You see, ignore his word, ignore his past faithfulness, and see if he'll do it now. Force God's hand, test God. And what does Jesus do? He turns around and he quotes verse 16. It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus kept this text. Jesus quoted this text and obeyed this text, and Jesus fulfilled all righteousness even in this text. Second time, I'm not doing these in the order of temptation either. Satan offered Jesus the whole world. Satan tempted Jesus with a plurality of gods. Satan said, look, everything has been given to me. All of this, all these kingdoms, it says he took him up to a high mountain and saw all kinds of kingdoms, all of this belongs to me, and I will give all of it to you if you'll just bow the knee. Think about it. Jesus is being offered everything, and he won't have to go through a cross to get it. What does Jesus say? He quotes verse 13. He says, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God. You see that in verse 13? It's the Lord your God you shall fear. It's the Lord your God you shall fear. Don't worship other gods. And Satan's saying, 
You just worship me. I'll give you whatever you want. Jesus says, no. The law says, God's righteousness says, don't worship anyone except God. Now, you might ask, so what about prosperity? We've, we've seen the testing temptation. We've seen the temptation of adversity. When was Jesus tempted to forget God and prosperity? He was never rich in a day in his life, was he? You just have to rewind a little bit. You just have to rewind to before the incarnation. Do you know what scripture tells us about Jesus bathing in prosperity? I'll read to you from Hebrews 12. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The, the, the translation there is a bit ambiguous. It says, for the joy that was set before him, which sounds like it could be he was doing it for the joy, you know, the purpose. That's what he was aiming at. No, no. The Greek preposition is in exchange for the joy that was set before him. Jesus already had plenty of joy. Jesus already had everything he needed. The worship of angels, everything he needed. He doesn't need anything. Jesus had no need of anything. Jesus had everything. And he gave it up. He gave it up and he endured a cross and he despised the shame. It means he thought little of the shame. Didn't care. How about another one? Philippians 2. Jesus existed in the form of God. But he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being, bound, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, being equal with God, said, I'm not going to cling to it. I'm going to empty myself and become a human, and, and not just human, going to become a slave. I'm going to become a slave to the point where people are going to crucify me and kill me. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. When did Jesus live in prosperity? And when did Jesus remember God in prosperity? Precisely when he agreed to become a human. Can you imagine that? Israel and us, we see money, we see a house, we see a car, we see whatever, and we get distracted and we go, I want that. The Father says to Jesus in eternity past, in a conversation we don't know very much about. Son, I want you to give all of this up. I want you to go rescue fallen humanity. I want you to lay down your life for the sheep that I've given to you. And in order to do it, I want you to suffer. I want you to live in obscurity for 30 years. I want you to live under opposition for three years to the point where you are condemned unjustly and have lies and slander told about you and yet remain entirely silent and allow them to, to, to flog you and to mock you and to spit on you and to crucify you. I want you to give up everything for that. And Jesus said, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to obey you, Father. Jesus had more than we know. Jesus had more than we understand. And in the midst of everything that he had in heaven, he did not forget God in his prosperity. He gave up his prosperity for us to make wretches his treasure. You know another difference? The wealth that we have, where does it come from? It comes from God's hand. What did John the Baptist say? A person can't receive one thing unless it's given him from heaven. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 4? What do you have that you didn't receive? Everything that we have has been given to us from the grace of God. Everything that Jesus had and gave up was rightly his. He gave up everything for us, friends. Everything. Everything. And thank God, after his resurrection, he received it all back. Because of this, God has given him the name that is above all names. God has given him all authority. He is exalted once more in the heavens. The point is, 
in redeeming us, he went through what our text talks about. The temptation to forget God in prosperity, the temptation to test God in adversity, the temptation to worship other gods, and he passed it with flying colors. The, the areas where Israel failed, the areas where, where you and I fail, beloved, they don't phase Jesus. Of course, he was tempted. He understands the draw, and yet he's stronger than we are. In the understatement of the century, Christ is stronger than we are. Amen? Friends, if you want to stand forgiven before God, it's not a matter of you reading this and going, okay, I'm going to try. It's a matter of you seeing that you can't do this and that Jesus did it and that we can only have hope in him. That's Jesus facing prosperity and plurality and adversity. Now, what about us? What does this text have to do with us? How does it warn us against these three temptations? Well, number one, beloved, I hope this text startles you. I hope that this text jars you. Why? Because we are living in the most prosperous society in human history. When Israel is talking about prosperity, they're talking about having lots of goats and cattle. When we're talking about, about prosperity, we are talking about the average life of a human being now. Look, Solomon, Solomon had more gold than you and I have. Solomon did not have a refrigerator. He didn't have an air conditioner. He didn't have a car. He couldn't have, here's the richest guy in the world at the time, and he couldn't imagine the lives that we live. Beloved, we are so prosperous, we should be warned by this text that we ought not to forget God in the midst of our prosperity. So let us not forget where our blessings have come from. Let us not forget why is it that we have clothes? Why is it that we have food? Why is it that we have money in our bank accounts? Because God has been kind. Not because we deserve it. Not because we've worked for it. Because God has been kind. Jeremiah Burroughs in his book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. I told you that, about that one during the Ten Commandments too. The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. He says that everything a Christian owns is a trinket of God's love. How can we be content? We can remember that everything we own is a trinket of God's love. And he says, look, same illustration I've been using. You've got a, a, a wife, and she's married to a guy who's a sailor, and he goes sailing for six months or a year or two years or three years, and he sends her home a little trinket, a little souvenir from India. And it's a little wood figurine, and it's not worth anything, and it's probably ugly. To that woman... It's a trinket of her husband's love, and it is priceless. Jeremiah Burroughs says, how can you and I be content? By recognizing that everything we have has been given to us by God's providence, and everything we have is a trinket of his love and his attention for us. Talk about not forgetting God. Where did our prosperity come from? Here's what it comes down to. What's your treasure? What is your real treasure? Remember where, what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When it comes down to it, and, and you have the money that you need and more, when you have the things that you need and more, you have to ask yourself, what do I love? Do I love the treasure or do I love the God who graciously granted me the material wealth that I have? Why did Jesus throw out all of his prosperity? Because he loved the Father. Why have Christians throughout the ages thrown out their wealth and their prosperity for the sake of persecution or for the sake of going on the mission field? Because they know that, tr that Christ is a treasure like no other and they want the rest of the world to know that Christ is a treasure like no other. Friends, we will be obsessed with our prosperity until we see that Christ is more valuable than our stuff. What is your treasure? What do you love?
What about us facing a plurality of gods? If we love God, then we will cling to him in a society that worships other gods. Boy, we could spend a long time on that one, couldn't we? We could spend a long time asking and answering the question, what are the gods of our culture? And how are you and I tempted to go and serve the other gods that our culture worships? I'm not going to do that today because we don't have enough time. Here's what I am going to do. I want to speak to the teenagers and to the 20-somethings for a moment. Okay? I want to talk to the kids who are in high school and the kids who are in college. There is what's been called an epidemic in our culture of kids graduating high school, moving out on their own, moving in with roommates, going to college, getting a job, doing whatever. And and then what do they do? They abandon Christ. They abandon ship. They go live in the world. They go serve the gods of our culture, be whatever they are. Here's what I'm telling you, kids. Don't do it. It is a temptation for you. It will be a temptation for you. Your friends are going to worship other gods. They're going to invite you to worship other gods. It might be a religion. It might be atheism, which is a religion. It might be worshiping college and education or the government. The world wants us to worship their gods. It will be a temptation for you if it's not already. Don't go. If you love God, you'll stay with him. You know what this text tells us is that's not new. Israel's going into the land and he says, don't go after their gods. You are going to go into the land soon. Don't go after their gods. You know what else this text tells us? That if you do, that goes for any of us, if you or any of us abandon ship and go worship a false god, did you read in the text what you will provoke? Look at verse 15 again. The Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Friends, if you abandon ship and go serve other gods, you will provoke the anger and the jealousy of a holy God. Let me tell you, that is not somewhere you want to find yourself. You know, I've had people tell me when I talk like this, you're using fear to motivate us. You're just trying to make us afraid. Don't do fearful things. Can you imagine if somebody said, I think I'm going to go play out on the highway. I think I'm going to run out on I-84 with a blindfold on. And I said, you shouldn't do that. You're going to get hit by a car. You're probably going to die. And they go, you're just trying to make me afraid. It's a scary thing. It's a stupid thing. Scripture tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Do not provoke God's anger by leaving him and by going and worshiping the gods of the culture. Don't do it. More than that, when when it says his jealousy, we often think of this, oh, God is just so mean. He He wants to squash our fun and be a wet blanket, that jealous God. No, no, friends. God's jealousy is wonderful. God's jealousy is a wonderful thing. It's not God coveting after something that doesn't belong to him. It's God being zealous and exclusive over what is rightly his. Think of God's jealousy as the jealousy that spouses have for each other in marriage. Look, we're married. We have a special bond that doesn't belong to anybody else. And if you're not jealous after your spouse, that's a symptom of a bad marriage. It is a good thing that God is jealous after us. Don't provoke his jealousy. Don't provoke his wrath. If you love God, you'll stay with him. Don't go into the land and go after other gods. Amen? By the way, the world overpromises and underdelivers. The world tells you you can have everything you want. It's not going to cost you a dime. It's going to be worth it. Everything's going to be okay. And if you worship idols, what you'll find is that you might be gratified for a time. But at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself empty, sorrowful, callous, and lost. Don't go after other gods. 
love God and stay with him. Finally, what does this text tell us about adversity? Let us not test God. Do not test the Lord your God at you tested him at Massa. How do we test God? We test God when we make demands of God right now. For example, if God loves me, he'll heal me of this cancer. If God loves me, he'll fix my marriage. If God loves me, he'll give me more money. If God loves me, he'll do what I'm demanding that he do. That's testing God. It's saying he hasn't proven his love yet. He hasn't proven his love enough. He hasn't proven his trustworthiness. And so regardless of everything that God has done in the past, I'm setting the terms right now. God, if you love me, you will do what I'm telling you to do. Let me tell you, that's getting out of line. If you love God, you won't test God. If you love God, you will live in his promises. If you love God, you will live in his past acts of of wonder and of faithfulness. And so if you're struggling, you're going, I just don't know if God loves me the way that I think he should. Or I really would like for God to do X, Y, and Z for me. Stop calling the terms for yourself. Don't give God hoops to jump through. Instead, he's the one that dictates the terms for us. And and frankly, he's the one that has proven his love and his power and his commitment over and over and over again. Friends, for for, for Israel, was the exodus really not enough? Was, Was manna in their bellies really not enough? Was the law that we're reading really not enough? No. He's given us more than enough. Now, how about us who are on the other side of the cross? If the cross isn't enough to be convinced of God's love, then nothing is. If you can't look at the cross and see that God loves you and is committed to you, then you're not going to be convinced by anything else. So just quit trying. If we love God, we won't test him and demand, make demands. If we love God, we will look back in the past And we will remember his acts of faithfulness. So here's here's what I'm telling you to do. When you get into trials and when you start questioning God and you're frustrated with him and you want him to do what you want him to do, look back. Look to the Exodus. Look to God's wonderful and powerful works that he did throughout the Old Testament. Look at the cross where God sent his son Jesus to suffer for his people. If God was untrustworthy, if God was going to break his word, do you know when he would have done it? He would have done it to spare his son. When Jesus is begging his father, sweating blood on his face, crying, Father, I don't want to go through this. If there is any other way, please spare me. If God was going to break his word, it would have been to spare his son, Jesus. Friends, if Jesus was going to break his word, it would have been to avoid the cross. He is trustworthy. He is not dishonest. He is not unfaithful. He keeps his word to his own, to the cost of his own life. When you have things you want, don't make demands and say, God, if you love me, you'll fill in the blank. You'll look back and you'll say, God, you have proven over and over and over again how much you love me and how committed you are to your people. You don't owe me anything. You've given me far more than anything I ever could have asked for, both in material blessings and in promises. Lord, I have cancer. I have a failing marriage. I have a dying child. I have whatever need. Whatever you do, Lord. I know that you love me. I don't like it. I don't like the idea of going through whatever you have for me. But, but whatever you have for me, I know that you love me and that you're committed. Friends, if we love God, we will trust him when he doesn't give us the things that we want. Amen? If we love God, let us remember God. If we love God, let us not forget him in prosperity. If we love God, let us cling to him 
in a plurality of gods. If we love God, let us trust him and obey him and cling to him, even when we don't have the things that we want. If we want to love God, we need to know Christ. We need to know the one who has gone through all of this for us and more. So if you want what I'm telling you about, it can only be found in coming to Jesus. It can only be found in knowing him. If you know him and see him for the treasure that he is, riches and other gods and trials won't hold a candle to the glory of knowing Christ. Come to him. Let's pray. God in heaven, there is simply no one like you. There is none like you. And and frankly, as we say that, you know it better than we do. But God, you are holy. You are kind. You are loving. You are committed. You are faithful. You are gracious. You are more than we could ever hope for, more than we could ever imagine. And yet, God, because we are sinful and because we live in a fallen world, we are so often distracted. We are distracted by trifles. We are distracted by garbage. We are distracted by sin. And yet, Lord, you can change our hearts. You can cause us to fall in love with you. You can give us your spirit who cries out, the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father. And yet, Lord, even though you've saved us, we still struggle with being distracted by all these other things. We thank you that you, you are so committed. We thank you that you are so patient, that you are so loving, you are so merciful, and that in spite of our temptations, you have mercy on us. And in spite of our sins and our failings, you have patience and grace and love for us. Thank you, God. Please help us to see you for who you are. And please help us to see the world for what it is, to see money for what it is, to see the other gods for what they are, to see trials and wants for what they are. Help us, Lord, to love you with our heart and our soul and our might. Help us to cling to Jesus in the cross and help us to remember you and love you in the land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.